it was like a battlefield. So I said to myself, there's very little chance that some of them are alive. Im Wallis ist es während einer Skitour zu einem tödlichen Unglück gekommen. Eine Gruppe ausländischer Berggänger kam nie dort an, kurz vor der Hütte am Pigne da Rolla. Vorgestern waren 14 Skitourengänger in einen Sturm geraten. Immer mehr Details zur Tragödie werden bekannt. Für Staatsangehörige. Eine kritische Zustand. Unterkühlten Berggänger. Dort starben drei weitere Personen. Staatsanwaltschaft hätte Untersuchungen geleitet. Ich erinnere mich sehr gut an die Bilder, die durch die Presse sind. Äh, nur ja, weniger als 48 Stunden, nachdem wir zurückgekommen sind von unserer Ortroute, äh, nachdem wir bei strahlendem Sonnenschein an dieser Stelle, genau dieser Stelle, durchgelaufen und durchgefahren sind. Und das war unglaublich schockierend. Gewesen. Steil bergauf mit Harscheisen, den Steighilfen an den Skis, geht es auf den Gol de la Serpentine. Quer durch gewaltige Gletscherabbrüche, über Spalten verdeckt vom Schnee des letzten Winters. Dann ein Stopp vor dem heikelsten Stück des Aufstiegs. Häuser, die Sonnengrenze, Sonnenbrüllen trinken, essen. Gehen wir fünf Minuten wieder. Dann gehen wir dann noch flach führen. Dann machen wir zwei Seilschaften. An so einem Tag für die Vorbereitung muss man sicher mal den Wetterbericht studieren. Von der Lawinensituation. Mal schauen, ob die Gruppe noch fit ist, wie fit sie noch ist, ob sie schon müde ist. Und, und, und vor allem das Wetter. Ja. Und das kann man am Abend vor der Hütte relativ gut abchecken. Wie nahe das Leben und Tod auf einer solchen Tour beieinander liegen, zeigt sich zwei Tage später, als eine andere Gruppe an dieser Stelle in einen Sturm gerät. Die Orientierung verliert und sieben Personen in der Kälte ums Leben kommen. Die Walliser Staatsanwaltschaft hat neue Erkenntnisse zum Bergdrama vom letzten Wochenende am Pigne da Rolla. Der italienische Bergführer ist, entgegen anderen Annahmen, während der Nacht bei seiner Gruppe geblieben. Am Morgen hat er versucht, Hilfe zu holen, schreibt heute die Walliser Staatsanwaltschaft. Dabei ist er in den Tod gestürzt. Was dieser Gruppe widerfahren ist, sei der Supergau in den Bergen. Ja, das ist, das ist natürlich schon ganz schwierig. Aber wir als Bergführer, wir probieren immer so lange wie möglich bei den Gästen zu bleiben. Das ist klar. Und die, letzte aus, aus, die letzte Lösung, wenn man wirklich nichts anders kann, dann muss man halt die Gruppe verlassen, um Hilfe zu organisieren. Sonst gibt es vielleicht noch mehr Tote. Für mich ist die Etappe, wo das schlimme Unglück passiert ist, eigentlich eine Etappe, in der ich mich sehr wohl gefühlt habe. Gleich hat man natürlich permanent gemerkt, dass man da im hochalpinen Gelände unterwegs ist, dass das Wetter unglaublich schnell wechseln kann. Dass man am Schluss ist man ein Spielball von der Naturkräfte in so einem Gelände, das war klar. Gewesen. Sich vorzustellen, was jemandem in so einer Situation durch den Kopf geht, finde ich unglaublich schwierig. Und es muss einfach grausam sein. Ich meine, wenn du dort so exponiert stehst und du kämpfst einfach um dein Leben in diesem Moment und hast den Tag wahrscheinlich mit ganz, ganz anderen Gedanken angefangen. Und das muss sehr, sehr grausam sein für, für alle, die gestorben sind, aber auch für die Überlebenden. My name is Tommaso Piccioli. I'm just turned 50 this year. And uh, I'm an architect and uh, we were about to do the hot route. We knew that the bad weather was coming. We didn't know how bad it was, but we knew it. So we managed to do the first three days in a, I'd say, ideal way. Yeah, and then, you know, the wet, bad weather came and everything, I mean, everything went wrong from just 
couldn't go worse than that, <laughs> you know. Yeah. Betty, it was my best friend in Bolzano. I was skiing all the time with, touring skiing, also normal skiing. Uh, we went many times skiing together, and then she said, well, I said, my, the idea was mine. I said, Let, why don't we do the whole tour this year? We were, we were both free, so let's do it. And she said, oh, that's great. I always wanted to do it all my life because my dad did it. I think she, he did it 11 times in the past. So her dad was an expert of the old route. We were, were supposed to do that trip. It's called Serpentine. So you have like maybe three hours climb. There's a saddle. You ski down. And the feature of this trip, and that's why there's no way you have to do it with bad weather, is that and I learned it afterward because I didn't know anything. I mean, I didn't inform because I was with a guide, so, which is still a mistake because you always have to know where to go. You have to have maps and stuff. But you know, that they, you know when you have a guide, you're lazy. So you just trust in him. It's a mistake, but that's what happened. Not only for me, for all of us. So basically this trip, up the saddle, go down, skiing down, and then there's a, a forced passage between two rocks of two meters width. So you have to get through this, uh, how do you say, bottleneck. And then after that, there's a long traverse, but easy. And then you get, you are at the, the vignette. The morning, uh, the guy decided to go. Nobody say anything about it, which is quite, for me, it's a bit worrying, this thing, because we knew the weather was coming. I went to talk with the guide then, and said, what are we going to do here? He said, we start, and then if you see bad weather, we come back. That was the plan. But that morning, we just started, and, you know, because he went, we all got along. And then we climb, let's say, a couple of hours, and we find ourselves in a whiteout, which is a condition where you can't see two meters away, so it's pretty bad. And then, you know, we got lost, and we've been lost all day. The guy had a mobile phone with the maps he used for a while, and then I think it got frozen, so it went off. I mean, I can't guarantee, but I have a very improved sense of orienteering. So I, I, I was saying that it was running in circles. That's why I offer my GPS and um, I can show it to you. So this same GPS is the one we used all day. I was looking at the GPS and the guy was heading the group. That's the way we did the last bit to the saddle. So we were heading towards the hut, but we were finding rocks all the time. So we couldn't get into that passage. We were going down here, and here is where the tragedy occurred. Because we couldn't go through here because of that rock thing, you know, the passage. I was optimistic because, I, the, I mean, that's why I never lost control because uh, the, the, it was showing that we were very close. We were in a, on a straight line. We were probably 500 meters, very close. So the, 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 my guide said, I saw some uh, Omini, which is like a, a stone uh, towers. So we tried to get there, but to get there, there was a very bad climb. So all the people went exhausted but we managed to do it. And he decided we were staying there. We're gonna dig a hole here, which was totally impossible because there was no snow. It was like a saddle, a rocky saddle. So what I did, I dig as much as I can under the, the rock 
and uh, that's what we did for a while but because it was so windy there was no point i mean if you dig a hole there's no wind inside that's why you survive but with the wind blowing you're gonna die man. I mean, I mean, I've been lucky not to, I mean, it, it, it was obvious that we all died there, in that kind of condition. Betty was exhausted, then when the night started, she was calling my name. She was like, she called my name so many times, like, help me or something. And I said, look, the only thing, you don't have to fall asleep, yeah? So I shouted, look, you have to move, you have to plan to move eight hours from now. I would, I would have shouted to Betty to just stay awake, but I couldn't do much. I, I, I flipped her two or three times because she was going, with her face down in the snow. I don't know why. And I was freaking her, but there wasn't much I could do. Because I had to do this movement, you know, I, this is the minimum movement you can do to stay alive. You can't do much. Maybe I was sleeping doing the movement, I don't know, because uh, one thing that I remember is that I had Francesca beside me, not Julia, I had Francesca, and I was hugging them, her, I was hugging her, and she was hugging me like, like if we were lovers, you know? And then, I, I don't know, something happened, and Francesca was Julia, I mean, Francesca, at one, at one stage I realized she wasn't Francesca anymore, but was Julia. So Francesca was just there, and she was covered by snow, and there was Julia there. So I don't know what happened, but I didn't realize that. Probably it happened that Francesca kind of, I don't know why she walked away, really, I, I don't know. But she was just a few meters away, and I had Julia with me. So she, I don't know. And that was in the morning. And then in the morning we opened our eyes, then we were crossing. And then she spot this group of skiers just underneath. I went there with my last energies and I started yelling and they saw me. And then I went back, wait, and after 15 minutes I saw people, rescuers around the camp, and then the helicopter arrived. It was like a battlefield, and they were all covered by snow. <coughs> so I said to myself, there's very little chance that some of them are alive. And also, I wasn't sure that Betty died, so I was still hoping that. You know, she arrived at the hospital alive with a body temperature of three degrees. Jesus. And that's why she died. The last two months has been hard, like couldn't sleep. Now it's getting better, but I, I felt like unstructured, weak in many things. And also angry. I mean, especially, I mean, I love Betty. So it was, for me, it was an important person. So emotionally, I mean, also for me, because I'm angry for me too, because you know, these things changed my life. So it's, it's hard. But, you know, it's, it's not the same as before. But now I really want to fight. I mean, there must be a setup of the whole thing.
Solange wir Leute in die Berge gehen, wird es immer Umfall geben. Das ist einfach so. Aber man muss halt zwischen den Mut haben und umkehren. Das ist wichtig. Ich persönlich glaube, halt, dass man mit Vorbereitung das Risiko kann minimieren kann, bis zu einem gewissen Grad. Und nachher man verliebt sich in etwas. Ich habe mich ins Skifahren verliebt, von klein auf. Und man wählt das nicht, weil es so gefährlich ist oder weil es so viel Gefahren birgt. Man verliebt sich halt. Und für mich ist das wie etwas, das einfach zu meinem Leben gehört. Und ich wäre nicht der gleiche Mensch, wenn ich nicht mehr Skifahren könnte, wenn ich nicht mehr ähm, so Sachen machen könnte. Und darum, ja, ich glaube, mit einer guten äh, Mannschaft, mit einer guten Vorbereitung würde ich wieder gehen. Weil was wir haben erleben durften, war etwas Einmaliges. Gewesen.